Hi, I'm Hannah Coy, and I'm back to talk a little bit about ritual when you're not really a ritual person. There are many people who come into atheopaganism and who are interested in it who come firmly from the atheist side, and they might be open to the idea of ritual, but really clueless where to begin. For most of us who are atheists, you know, we when we do have some ritual experience, it usually doesn't, it doesn't involve full consent on our part. That said though, there are a lot of good reasons to experiment with ritual. One of them is that it can be hard to express powerful emotions through everyday structures of communication. Another reason is that they can feel very nice. You can really orient them towards the appreciation of the senses. And finally, they can give more structure to your sense of time. I am going to tell you a story about a ritual that I have developed for myself and that I've been really enjoying. And I hope that that can give you some inspiration. For me, one of the first things I wanted to do to, to turn my ideas into praxis was to start observing the Sabbaths in the wheel of the year. I had had some experience observing in an informal sense some of these events, you know. Who doesn't love a good solstice, even if you don't think of yourself as a pagan? If you have any interest in science and astronomy, you've probably been drawn towards a little bit of celebration. My challenge here was how to take that feeling and distribute it amongst all of the eight Sabbaths. You know, how to make sure that I was giving all of them equal attention. That was difficult because some of them felt easy to get into, the summer and winter solstices. And then there were things like Lunasa and Beltane. And I was kind of like, well, I, I know of some traditions, but I'm not ready to do a Maypole. So I wanted to come up with something simple for myself that was relevant to all eight of the Sabbaths and that was a unification of them. So that no matter what else I did, I would have something that tied all of those together as these are the important points of the, the year that I am observing with this ritual. Then I could be free to elaborate more or less as I, as I felt inspired. On the winter solstice of December, 2020, I had a great opportunity to get started on this because I was going to be camped out at a Unitarian Universalist church camp. There's this wilderness camp in the Sierra Ancha Mountains in Arizona, and I will drop a link to their website down below because it's a great place. This is a, really a wilderness area with, with a couple of cabins on it, and my partner and I were going to be staying up at one of the cabins for a few days, and it was going to be during the winter solstice. And so I thought this was a perfect time to start working on ritual development. I took a notebook with me and I took Mark's guidelines for rituals and started to put together what I thought needed to be in there or that I wanted to be in there. I had some elements in mind. I knew for a fact that I wanted to have a campfire and that that wasn't necessarily going to be the thing I could repeat all the time because I wouldn't always be in the right location for it. I also knew there was an astronomical conjunction on that day. It was um, between Jupiter and Saturn. I knew that I wanted that to be a part of this particular ritual. And again, that it wasn't necessarily going to be something that I could pull into every Sabbath, but it gave me a place to start. So I knew I was picturing outdoors and I knew that I was going to be in a 100 acre wood. So I thought exploring that right and, and hiking around, I want that to be part of it. So what dawned on me is that if before sunset, I went on a walk that I would find something on that walk, an object that spoke to who I was in that moment and that that something would become a focus. It would become a ritual object and it would be the presence of that object that would be my unifying element in all of my Sabbaths to come. For me, the sense of religious wonder that I'm trying to build, which is not rooted in the supernatural, it's rooted in my experiences with the natural world. And so going on a walk and finding an object 
seemed like a perfect in illustration of that. So when we were out there, we did a lovely afternoon hike and I kept my attention out for the right kind of object, just knowing that I would know it when I saw it. And this is what I found. It didn't look like this. <laughs> it didn't have the marks on it, but it was, it's, it's a bone. It's a deer leg bone. That was, that was it. You know, I picked it up and I looked at it and I saw that, so I, I found it in a canyon that had had some flooding events and this bone had signs of being a little bit waterlogged. It, it had already done some traveling, you know, from the time that it ceased to be part of a living organism and became an object in its own right. Uh, and I could see that it had, it had some chew marks, you know, so some large animal had been working on it. And all of those things just stood out to me as this nice illustration of the way that change happens. Something that's part of a living organism. And when I think of my bones, I think of them in relation to who I am. And when I'm gone, assuming I'm not cremated or something, I guess my bones will still exist, but they won't really be a part of me in the same way. They'll go on to have a life of their own. That's what this bone was happily doing. So when I decided to appropriate it for my own ritual purposes, I am also giving it a different life now. I, I enjoyed the way that both the ephemeral and the eternal balanced out conceptually in this idea. And so I thought, well, yes, the thing to do now with this is to change it with deliberation, to intentionally change it on each Sabbath in some way or another. I also found a tree that had been struck by lightning, and so I prized a little piece of charcoal off of it because my thought was that, well, I'm going to draw something on this bone. That's going to be my first alteration of it. Uh, using the charcoal from the tree felt right and powerful. So I came back and I had two elements of my ritual. I was like, okay, I've got a bone, I've got charcoal, I know I can draw on the bone with the charcoal, and I've got a fire, and let's see, what can I do with the fire? I guess I can wave the bone over the fire, <laughs> baptize it in the smoke of the flame, and if I'm here saying this is a sacred fire, then it's like I'm transferring some of the sacredness of the fire into my new ritual object. And I felt, well, let me be honest, I was approaching this largely at this point thinking like an artist. If I were trying to think like a scientist while doing this, it would have been much, much more awkward. And that's not because we can't have nice ritual things as scientists, we absolutely can. But it just doesn't lend itself well to the language of metaphor and symbolism. If you have a tendency to be like that, you know, a very scientific thinker, that's still great and you can still do beautiful rituals. You don't have to go along this route at all. But I would say that getting comfortable with non-literal symbolism is very helpful when it comes to creatively designing rituals. For me, another really fun aspect of ritual is both taking it seriously in the sense of being very honest with it, but not imbuing it with a lot of gravitas. For me, it was important that I was doing things and that if they were a bit arbitrary, that I was naming that. So I believed that when I waved my bone over the smoke, I was doing it in kind of a silly way, tongue in cheek, but also being honest about it. This was what I was doing and it was a symbolic act. To, to get back to the that first ritual, um, it was as simple as having an opening invocation with some qualities that I invited my friends around the campfire to share. So there were, there were four of us. Um, one of them was my partner who is very skeptical of ritual. And so having that sense of humor aspect was also important in including him. I wanted to give people room to feel silly and not have that be a betrayal of what we were doing. So silliness was a part of this, but it was also very lovely and fun. We had a fire, we had an altar, we had some objects of sacred significance, the bone. I drew a sun on it. It's not this one, this, this has evolved over time, but this is the place where I drew the sun on it. I drew the moon on the other side. I talked about this bone, about its life, 
and about the life that I hope to give it. My intention in that was to not own it, but to have a conversation with nature. I gave people blessings with the bone once I had waved it over the fire, just because that seemed like the thing to do next. And it was silly and fun and also felt great. So we watched The Conjunction. Then we had some campfire songs and just generally had a great time. And I came home with something that I knew I could do each of the Sabbaths, which was to change this sacred object in some fashion. I have experimented with different ways of making marks on this bone since then. I've done a little bit of relief carving. I've used pencil. I've used different kinds of inks and pens, and I've let it be an imperfect process. I don't know where this is gonna go, and that's part of what is lovely about it to me. It doesn't have to go in a particular direction. I always find something I can do. So that's an example of how this can work. It's hard to describe how much fun this process has been. It's so visceral and satisfying and a reminder of both life and death to have a bone to work with. It's very satisfying to, to make and remove the marks and to have that happen in a reflective state of mind in which I am thinking about changes that happen and then the changes that we choose. That's rather comforting thought. It's also something that I can bring to certain occasions and give people blessings with. And that tends to be a really fun experience as well. And the sort of blessings that I'm giving are, they're usually, again, on the silly side. I like to keep things light because uh, I think that there is something inherently silly about imbuing a lot of sacredness into nature. However, I don't think the silliness takes away from the power of it. So there is an example of something that can come out of uncertainty. If that's appealing to you, feel free to try it on your own. I would, I would love to hear from you if you do. I hope that you are all having a lovely year so far, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.